Hello, everyone. We'll begin this webinar. And so welcome again to this IAS USA webinar. Today is Thursday, October 6, 2022. My name is Jose Francisco. I'm a project manager at IAS USA. We are excited to cover today's presentation regarding an update on the prevention and treatment of pediatric HIV infection. We are delighted to welcome Dr. Ellen Chadwick, Professor of Pediatrics at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago, Illinois. We'll go over our introduction slides and moderate our question and answer session at the end of this webinar. Welcome, Dr. Chadwick. Thank you, Jose, and welcome everyone. Uh, we're delighted that you have an opportunity to join this webinar today, which I think is going to be extremely informative. Uh, Jose, if you'd like to show us the um, housekeeping slides that we'll start with, um, we'll go through these quickly. Uh, this shows the financial relationships for our uh, content on the web board within the last two years. And this uh, slide shows uh, the conflicts that Dr. Abrams and myself, as well as the um, peer reviewers, have uh, stated. And uh, our CME information is that this is a 1.25 CME credit um, as issued by IAS USA. And as well, um, it's been approved for 1.25 hours of ABIM mock points, as well as for nursing, pharmacy, and pharmacotherapy credit. Uh, this webinar has received generous support from the following contributors listed on the slide. And um, just a note that the on-demand recording and slides from the webinar will be available within 24 hours after this live broadcast at the link uh, listed below. Uh, in navigating this activity uh, for the poll questions, a separate window will show the poll question, and you should re you should choose your response for the poll, and then uh, the responses will be displayed after the poll closes. Submitting questions can be done throughout the, uh, the talk and will be addressed at the end. Um, submit through the Q&A button, um, and uh, we will try to get to all the questions, but we apologize if we will not be able to get all of them uh, in within the allotted time. Uh, the chat will be open uh, for people to discuss, but questions will only go through the Q&A session. So it is now my honor to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Elaine Abrams, who is Professor of Pediatrics and Epidemiology at Columbia University Medical Center and Senior Research Director of ICAP Global Health at Columbia University. Dr. Abrams has a distinguished history of contributions in the field of pediatric and maternal HIV. As director of Columbia University's MTCT Plus initiative, she led the world's first global HIV treatment program, demonstrating it was possible to provide care and antiretroviral treatment in resource-limited settings, using programs to prevent perinatal transmission of HIV as an entry point. This program saved millions of children in Africa and Asia from acquiring HIV while keeping mothers healthy. Dr. Abrams has been a leader in the IMPACT Network, as, uh, including as chair of the Primary Therapy Scientific Committee and as chair of the 2022 Conference of Retroviruses and Opportunistic Infections, or CROI. And I might add that she is the only pediatrician to have served in this capacity and she is current co-chair of the International Workshop on HIV Pediatrics. She served on the advisory panels for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the World Health Organization to set global standards for the management of children with HIV. Dr. Abrams has authored over 350 scientific manuscripts and mentored over 20 domestic and international young investigators in the field, most of whom have become independent researchers and clinicians. So you can see we are honored to have Dr. Abrams presenting today on update on the prevention and treatment of pediatric HIV infection. Elaine? Ellen, thank you so much uh, for this very generous and far too long introduction. Uh, I'm really honored to be um, speaking speaking today, and let's see if I can get the slides and video straight. 
So tell me, can do I have the right screen? We're ready to go? Yes, looks great. Fantastic. So thanks again. Um, today, the, the learning objectives of this webinar um, are to describe advances and setbacks in preventing new pediatric infections globally, summarize advances in the identification and treatment of children with HIV infection, and translate the latest research into best practices to optimize care for children with HIV infection. We'll now turn to our first pretest question. You have a patient newly diagnosed with HIV infection during antenatal screening. Which of the following regimens is currently recommended as preferred for pregnant people initiating antiretroviral treatment? Victegravir, tenofovir, alafenamide, and tricytabine fixed dose combination, alvitegravir, cobicistat, and tricytabine, tenofovir, alafenamide, FDC, dalutegravir, abacavir, lamivudine, FDC, and intramuscular cabotegravir, ropivirine. We'll give you a minute to complete. For half a minute. Fantastic. We'll go on now to pretest question number two. You are asked to consult on a newborn infant born to a parent whose last viral load in pregnancy was 200 copies per ml three weeks prior to delivery. Which of the following regimens is recommended for infant postnatal prophylaxis? Cydovidine twice daily for four weeks, Cydovidine, Lamivudine, and Nivirapine twice daily up to six weeks, Abacavir plus Lamivudine plus twice daily Dalutegravir twice daily plus dalutegravir once daily for six weeks, or zidovudine plus lopinavir, ritonavir twice daily for six weeks. Please go ahead and complete the poll. We'll come back to these questions at the end. Super. So the outline of this talk will begin with prevention of pediatric infection and starting with prevention of, of pediatric HIV, the epidemiology, as well as new findings and outstanding questions, and then look at treatment of children with HIV, the testing to treatment cascade, and new findings and outstanding questions in pediatric treatment. So in 2021, there were an estimated 1.7 million children less than 15 years of age living with HIV infection globally, and an estimated 160,000 new pediatric infections, 82% occurring in Sub-Saharan Africa. While the number of new HIV infections among children has declined by 52% since 2010, progress in preventing vertical transmission has slowed. We can see that in 2021, the proportion of women with HIV receiving ART in pregnancy, the red bars, reached 81% globally, and that this level of coverage has been stagnant since 2014. In turn, the number of new pediatric infections in the black line has not dropped significantly, and we remain or off course to reach elimination targets. Here you can see antiretroviral coverage in pregnancy globally and by region annually from 2010 through 2021. There are also substantial regional differences with much higher coverage in Eastern and Southern Africa compared to West and Central Africa where an estimated 60% of pregnant women received ART. Notably, access to free and low-cost antenatal services and maternity services are also substantially lower in West and Central Africa. Using this stat bar analysis from Mary May at UNAIDS, 
we can drill down to identify key gaps along the prevention cascade. Of the 160,000 new pediatric infections, 35,000 or 22% were attributed to a mother um, infected during pregnancy or breastfeeding. Close to half of all new pediatric infections, 75,000 or 48% occurred because the mother did not receive ART during breastfeeding or, or during pregnancy or breastfeeding. 22% of 34,000 infections can be attributed to the mother not continuing ART during pregnancy and breastfeeding and 8% to, to mothers who were on ART but not virally suppressed. Globally, about half new child infections still occur because pregnant women are not diagnosed and started on treatment. Almost half of those um, not receiving treatment are in West and Central Africa, and over half of the incident infections that lead to vertical transmission are in East and Southern Africa. To finish the prevention cascade, only 62% of infants born to mothers with HIV had a diagnostic test for HIV infection by week eight in 2021. And the geographic pattern looks the same as mothers on ART in pregnancy with babies in West, only 25% of babies in West Africa having that two month early infant diagnostic test reached as high as 71% in Southern and Eastern Africa. So pivoting to new findings and outstanding questions, one of the major factors affecting prevention cascade was the delayed rollout of dolutegravir in pregnant women. Just as WHO was on the cusp of recommending dolutegravir for first-line treatment in all adults, the SAPAMO study presented findings suggestive of an increased risk of neural tube defects among infants exposed to dolutegravir at conception in Botswana. WHO uh, issued conditional guidance for dolutegravir as the preferred first-line regimen with cautious language around the use in women of reproductive potential and pregnant women. It wasn't until July 2019 that they recommended dolutegravir unconditionally for all. In this analysis from the IDEA cohort, they examined dolutegravir uptake at 87 sites in 11 low and middle income countries. They found substantial disparities affecting females of reproductive age, 16 to 49 years old, which is only 30% dolutegravir coverage compared with 58% among males of the same age group. And these substantial disparities in dolutegravir uptake clearly were affecting females of reproductive age as early, as late as 2020. We have since had two pregnancy studies, Dolutec Dolphin 2 on the left and Vested on the right, that have demonstrated that dolutegravir-based ART in blue is superior to what was the standard of care in ART which is a Fabrans-based therapy to rapidly achieve and sustain viral suppression in pregnancy, and that is not associated with an increase in adverse pregnancy and birth outcomes. And just this summer at AIDS 2020, the Tsapamo study updated their findings, which they've been doing periodically. And in March 2018, as I said, they had four women among 494 with preconception dolutegravir, um, a prevalence of 0 0.94. In March 2022, four years later, there were 10 neural tube defects among 
9,460 preconception exposures, and the prevalence had come down to 0.11. With more than 224,000 observations overall of women delivering and on ART, they were able to demonstrate that the prevalence of neural tube defects was not substantially different in infants with dolutegravir exposure compared with other ARVs initiated prior to or during pregnancy. Hopefully these findings are reassuring enough to put this issue to rest, though they do highlight the need for continued surveillance of pregnancy and birth outcomes as new agents are introduced for both treatment and prevention. Pregnancy and breastfeeding are periods of high HIV acquisition risk. The WHO recommends oral tenofovir-based PrEP to pregnant and postpartum women with substantial HIV acquisition risk. However, multiple studies have demonstrated poor uptake of oral daily uh, tenofovir-based regimens among young women, including pregnant and breastfeeding women. There's great hope that efforts to prevent new infections among young women will be catalyzed with the introduction of injectable cabotegravir and continues to demonstrate superiority over TDF, FTC, preventing new infections among young women in both the blinded and unblinded continuation of HPTN 084. So you can see that in the unblinded, um, the unblinded 18 months report where women continued on cabotegravir on their their randomized regimen, there were three new infections, all attributed to inadequate um, ad adherence. Um, but overall, the hazards ratio was 0.11 for both the blinded and unblinded periods. Um, of note, there were over 60 pregnancies to women on IMCAB despite strict contraception requirements to participate in the study. We do not have safety and PK data for LA CAB in pregnancy, but is clearly urgently needed. Finally, there is renewed attention to postnatal prophylaxis for infants. Current WHO guidelines include risk stratification at birth based on maternal ART history and viral load and an enhanced two drug regimen with AZT and nivirapine for high risk infants during the first weeks of life. Prolonged daily infant postnatal prophylaxis during breastfeeding has been recommended in some countries to protect babies if mothers become viremic but the added value of this approach has not been demonstrated. The Impact Network and WHO convened a workshop on postnatal prophylaxis to explore whether there are opportunities to optimize postnatal prophylaxis approaches to further protect infants and reduce HIV vertical transmission, exploring different strategies and potential introduction of new agents like long-acting injectable CAB or BNABs or other agents that are becoming available and being studied for adults um, to look at their potential in the future for infants. Now, pivoting to prevention of new pediatric infections in the US, in 2019, the last year I could find published data, 32 children received a diagnosis of HIV infection attributed to perinatal transmission in the U.S., including six dependent areas. 37 areas reported no perinatally acquired infections among infants. I always like to show New York City, where I am from, and the trajectory of the perinatal HIV epidemic. You can see here that in the early 2000s, the number of new pediatric infection cases had dropped substantially and new child infections are truly a rare event. 
from 2016 to 2020, less than 1% of infants born to women with HIV infection were determined to have, um, to have HIV infection themselves. Now, this is a poor substitute for the gap analysis we looked at from UNAIDS, but it does provide some insights around risk for new pediatric infections in the U.S. Close to 97% of mothers of children who did not acquire HIV infection started ART either prior, 82%, or during pregnancy. 15%. And this compares with 45% um, before pregnancy and 19% during pregnancy, mothers starting ART among infected infants. 21% of the babies who acquired infection were born to, to women whose infection, whose HIV status was not determined until after the birth of the baby. Poor access to care, substance use, mental health concerns, and acute infection during breastfeeding have been associated with late identification of maternal status and reinforces the importance of retesting HIV negative women at risk at delivery late in the third trimester. Okay, so we'll pivot now to new findings and outstanding questions in, in the U, U.S. and uh, talk a little bit about uh, ART during pregnancy. The same regimens that are recommended for the treatment of non-pregnant adults should also be used in pregnant people when sufficient data suggests that appropriate drug exposure is achieved during pregnancy. That being said, the guidelines su suggest clinicians should weigh the risks of adverse effects for pregnant people, fetuses, and infants against the benefits of these regimens and recognize that safety data of ARVs in pregnancy are often incomplete and may take as long as six to 10 years before we have good dosing and safety data for new agents. Furthermore, in most cases, people who present for obstetric care on fully suppressive ARV regimens should continue their current regimens. So currently, dolutegravir and raltegravir are preferred instees for starting and continuing ART in pregnancy and adazanavir and darunavir are the preferred PIs. TAF was included as preferred only last year after adequate safety data was obtained. And long-acting cabotegravir and rapivirine, which is seeing increasing use in adult populations, are currently not recommended. There are limited PK data on long-acting CAB for prevention, but no PK and safety data yet on this combination in pregnancy. It will be studied in an upcoming impact trial. However, clinicians are increasingly seeing women on this regimen, particularly women who've endured adherence challenges with daily oral regimens, and they may be considering continuing this regimen with more frequent viral load monitoring rather than risk the loss of suppression with a switch back to daily oral treatment. A recent analysis from the FACTS cohort has provided more evidence around the safe and effective use of dolutegravir in the U.S., this is an observational study of over 12,000, 12, 1,200 pregnant women in routine care, median age, 29 years, 51% initiated preconception ART. In the table, you can see comparative rates of viral suppression at delivery 
by agent, as well as pregnancy and birth outcomes. The figure dem demonstrates differences, unadjusted and adjusted, as compared with dolutegravir in the probability of viral suppression. Overall, dolutegravir-based ART was superior to dolutegravir to ART with atazanavir, raltegravir, and alvitegravir cobicistat, and similar to darunavir, rilpivirine ART in achieving darunavir-based and rilpivirine-based ART in achieving viral suppression at delivery. There were no clear differences observed in the risk of adverse birth outcomes between dolutegravir and other regimens. One of the questions that we continue to ask is whether U equal U applies to vertical transmission. Pro, this prospective national cohort, including all pregnant women with HIV and their children at 90 French centers or followed since 1986 um, in, in France. And they were able to demonstrate that transmission rates were lowest with preconception ART, which we already know, but among 6,316 women on ART at conception, the proportion virally suppressed at delivery increased steadily over time. Most importantly, they found no perinatal transmission observed among five, over 5,000 infants born to women treated at conception and having undetectable viral load at less than 50 copies near delivery. Whether U equal U applies with less than 200 is still under some, some debate. As you can see here, there was some transmission at 50 to 399 copies, albeit very low. And questions about U equal U during breastfeeding um, remain um, un unanswered. However, we see that there is evolving um, feelings and evolving practices around breastfeeding in the US. While um, breastfeeding with suppressive ART to the mother is the recommended infant feeding um, by approach by WHO, in the US, breastfeeding has not traditionally been recommended for infants of mothers living with HIV infection. Replacement feeding is the only way to fully prevent new postnatal infections. However, with more potent, safer maternal treatments, this recommendation has come under scrutiny and the many benefits of breastfeeding have been underscored. Many mothers with HIV have expressed the desire to breastfeed. Um, many probably have been breastfeeding, but not sharing that with their, with their clinicians. And US guidelines are shifting to be more supportive of breastfeeding in fully suppressed women and recommend joint decision-making the clinical team, the woman, and her family. And this brings us back again to considerations around postnatal prophylaxis. Current US guidelines dictate that all infants born to mothers with HIV receive postnatal prophylaxis. Low risk infants um, who are they're termed or considered low risk if their mother received ART during pregnancy with viral suppression to less than 50 copies within four weeks prior to delivery and no concerns related to adherence. They should receive ZDV for four weeks. 
high risk babies should receive presumptive HIV therapy, a three drug ARV regimen to newborns who are considered at the highest risk. And basically high risk infant is any infant who doesn't meet low risk criteria. The mother didn't receive drugs, only received a, uh, intrapartum ARVs, or had documented elevated viral load within four weeks of delivery. And the recommended regimens for presumptive therapy, the ZDV, 3TC, and nivirapine, or raltegravir from birth up to six weeks. Infants with a positive neonatal test for HIV virus, a NAT test, would begin HIV therapy uh, upon diagnosis. Well, th are there opportunities to optimize approaches to postnatal antiretroviral regimens in the US? One question that's come up is, can the duration of postnatal prophylaxis be reduced or eliminated for infants of mothers with sustained viral suppression? Do we need six weeks of ZDV for those low-risk babies? Maybe four, maybe two, maybe none. Can we rapidly determine pecan safety of new potent agents like dolutegravir uh, for newborns and premature infants so that we could start using those for postnatal prophylaxis? Is there a role for long-acting agents and alternative delivery platforms to protect infants? Should infants receive ARB prophylaxis during breastfeeding? And practices vary as more moms in the U.S. are breastfeeding. Um, what regimens their infants receive or don't receive seems to be individually designed. And how often and when should maternal viral load and infant infection status be monitored during breastfeeding? We can expect to see a lot of inquiry around these questions over the years ahead. So we're going to pivot now to updates in children with HIV infection. Look at the testing to treatment cascade. Of the 1.7 children, 1.7 million children living with HIV globally in 2021, only 51% had known HIV infection status. And this compares with 86% of adults. So a little more than half of children living with HIV globally are known to have HIV infection and hence have the opportunity to initiate treatment. And as expected, treatment coverage globally for children living with HIV has remained stagnant over the last years. In 2021, 52% were receiving ART compared with 74% of adults and identification of children with HIV infection remains the major obstacle to treatment, as we saw with pregnant women. Of note, in 2021, only 35% of children with HIV in Western and Central Africa had known HIV status. And um, as you can see here, there are also low rates of viral suppression in children compared with adults. Here you see the proportion of people tested achieving viral suppression in PEPFAR supported programs by quarter. So each line is a quarter from dark to light uh, from quarter three in 20. 20, the dark bar through quarter four, 2021, disaggregated by age. For example, in the last quarter, 73% of zero to four year olds achieved viral suppression on treatment compared with 94% of 25 to 29 year olds. And this is just among those who are treated. This can primarily be attributed 
to the lousy regimens or hard to take regimens, primarily lopinavir, ritonavir, based ART, infants and young children were receiving. Shifting to the US, we see a somewhat different picture. There are an estimated 12,588 persons living with diagnosed perinatally acquired HIV, including 1,447 children less than 13 years of age um, living with diagnosed perinatal HIV infection. They were primarily in six, uh, seven states, New York, Florida, California, Texas, Pennsylvania, Georgia, and Illinois, and 57% of Black, African American, and 24% Latinx. Now, it's difficult to find good um, treatment epi data on children in the U.S. with perinatal infection. This figure depicts viral suppression among persons with perinatal HIV infection by age in New York City 2020. You will notice that there are only 34 children with perinatal HIV less than 12 years of age. And in gray, they have the highest rates of viral suppression, 91%. There are two individuals in New York City over 50 years of age, and the largest number in this perinatal cohort, so to speak, 530 in the 30 to 39 age bracket. Viral suppression between the ages of 20 and 50 hover at 70%. This gives a fairly good snapshot of the perinatal epidemic in New York City, um, which may be a little older than the rest of the country, but does capture the aging of the population into well into adulthood. So uh, let's look at updates in children with HIV infection. HIV self-testing has been broadly implemented in adult populations particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic when facility-based services were curtailed. HIV self-test kits, however, have not been previously studied in pediatric populations. This summer, Stecker and colleagues presented the results of a study of caregiver-assisted oral fluid-based HIV screening for children using a cross-sectional cluster sampling design at 32 facilities in Uganda and in Zambia. Caregivers with untested children in the household were offered test kits to use at home to test household children. Close to 97% of the eligible caregivers accepted the oral test kits. They were taught how to use them. And about 7,600 test kits were sent home. 97.6% or over 7,000 children were tested and the results were returned to the facilities. 1.6% or 119 children had reactive oral test kits and those children had to be brought back into the facility to have blood-based testing. 97.5% were brought, brought in. And just that alone decreased the need for facility testing by 98%. 37% of those with a positive screen were confirmed to have HIV infection and um, all of those, virtually all of those children started a antiretroviral treatment. So these long, long awaited data will hopefully expand the toolkit of pediatric case identification. And you could see how they may be extremely useful 
in settings with decreased access to health facilities. WHO recommends dalutegravir with a back of ear and 3TC. And once a pediatric formulation became available, attention has been focused on transitioning children and adolescents off current regimens to dalutegravir based treatment and initiating all new, newly identified children on dalutegravir based treatment. And there's been an extremely successful rollout of pediatric dolutegravir with over 50 countries placing orders during the COVID pandemic. Now, while the rollout has been robust, we are just beginning to see outcome data, which suggests that dolutegravir is as efficacious in real world settings as demonstrated in clinical trials. Again, at the summer meeting, we saw a retrospective review from seven Baylor sites in six countries with over 12, close to 12,000 children enrolled in care and prescribed dolutegravir. The majority were older, over 80% over 10, and close to 80% were ART experienced. Of those on ART at the time of switching regimens, 90.8% were virally suppressed. And overall of, of those they report on, 40% had a single drug substitution and the others had a complete regimen change. And the median time of follow-up on dolutegravir-based ART is close to two, two years. So as you can see in, in this figure, the rates of viral suppression post-switch were very high, 92% at six, 12, and 18 months with no differences by sex, age, or NRTI backbone. Of those children on ART with a single drug substitution, 95% were virally suppressed before dolutegravir. Among the 212 children not suppressed prior to the single drug substitution, 80% achieved and maintained suppression, and there was no difference by NRTI backbone. These findings provide a little bit of useful data to inform two of the controversial questions in pediatric treatment. Do you need viral load to guide the dolutegravir switch in children already on ART? And is it necessary to switch the NRTI backbone along with dolutegravir in viremic children? Are the findings from the adult trials like Nadia um, applicable in pediatric populations where we haven't had tenofovir, but rather abacavir and AZT? Two recent studies of early treated infants suggest, however, that ART alone may not be adequate. In the Earth Epical study, 212 infants initiated primarily lopinavir-based ART by three months of age. 23 infants died 74% in the first six months, half of AIDS-related causes. In impact P1115, 460 neonates started ART in the first weeks of life. And while over three quarters achieved viral suppression to less than 200 copies by 24 weeks, at two years, fewer than half remained suppressed to less than 20 copies. It's hopeful that the use of more potent, tolerable ART regimens will result in better outcomes. It's likely, however, that in settings with many other health threats, that to infants in particular, additional interventions will be necessary to decrease morbidity, 
and mortality, improve treatment outcomes, and ultimately to leave children in a position where they may be able to um, have periods of ART, um, of HIV remission and ART free periods. In the US, options for pediatric treatment have improved from the bad old days of multiple syrups, particularly in the population as the population ages, but overall options remain somewhat limited, particularly for infants and young children where nivirapine and lopinavir still linger. Rapidly changing physiology and growth impact drug absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion, excretion, creating a very challenging environment to determine pharmacokinetics, dosing, and safety of new agents for neonates and infants. And if you compare, you can see the the impressive number of different FDA approved ARVs available for adults and how that compares with the paucity of options and almost entirely liquid options for neonates less than four weeks of age. Dalutegravir is only approved for infants over four weeks and three kilos, but there are two planned studies to obtain dolutegravir dosing in neonates. Um, some important modeling work has been done to inform those studies, but the hope is that we'll be able to start that regimen from birth rather than relying on existing agents to start treatment. On the other end of the challenging spectrum are adolescents um, where there are increasing opportunities for simplified treatment. The FDA approval for the long-acting injectable uh, tabotegravir rolpivirine included adolescents aged 12 years and over 12 years and weighing greater than 35 kilo based on data from the impact MOCA study. Virologically suppressed adolescents on stable ART were switched to IM um, cabril and achieved exposures, exposure concentrations consistent with predictions and comparable to adults. They also did some qualitative work in MOCA that demonstrated the acceptability of the IM injections, particularly allowing young people to not be worrying about their daily adherence um, to, to their adherence to daily pills and um, frequent visits to pick up new pills. But with the introduction of this combination regimen in adolescent populations, questions and anecdotes are circulating. There's a lot of chatter around some virologic breakthroughs in adolescence um, and concern of high risk of selecting NCD resistance mutations. Um, questions are being asked about the optimal frequency of injections as well as the optimal frequency of viral load monitoring. And then, of course, many people want to know whether this formulation can be used in children and adolescents unable to maintain adherence to daily oral regimens. And we can hope that we know that dosing for children is now being studied but um, the question of using this regimen in less adherent population is yet to be addressed. So I'll close now. Um, and um, I think I probably used the word antiretroviral a record number of times during the presentation. 
but I want to underscore that it isn't all about treatment and it's not always about the virus and that for um, children and families affected by HIV, there are a multitude of other issues related and unrelated in their lives that are worthy of attention and at times intervention. And that at each patient encounter, we have to remember the many other issues affecting the lives um, and our lives um, of these children and families um, now and into the future. So I'll finish now by circling back to um, the post-test questions. Um, and I'll probably need some help from Jose on how to manage this, but I'll remind everybody of post-test question number one. You have a patient newly diagnosed with HIV infection during antenatal screening. Which of the following regimens is currently recommended as preferred for pregnant people initiating antiretroviral treatment? So, so the answer here is number three. Um, and uh, as we, as I mentioned, that there is a fine balance between using the same, uh, recommending the same regimens that are recommended for adults in non-pregnant adults, but keeping in mind safety and pharmacokinetic data uh, for in, in pregnant people. And regimen number three has now quite a bit of data demonstrating um, dosing, safety, and efficacy in pregnancy, whereas there's far less data and experience with these other regimens. In post-test question two, we pivoted to the infants. You're asked to consult a newborn, on a newborn infant born to a parent whose last viral load in pregnancy was 200 copies per ml three weeks prior to delivery. Which of the following regimens is recommended for infant postnatal prophylaxis? And the correct answer is number two, because this the viral load was 200, which is above 50 copies. The baby is not considered low risk, falls into a high risk category, and would get what was described as presumptive treatment for up with a three drug regimen for up to three weeks, uh, up to six, six weeks. The others are not recommended in this scenario. So stop now. And I think we turn to the question and answer period. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abrams. That was a fabulous presentation. You covered lots and lots of different uh, important issues to this field. Um, and we've had several questions in the Q&A. So we'll start with the first one from Hyun Kang or Kang. Um, the question is up to date and CDC's somewhat outdated articles currently still do not recommend dolutegravir for post-exposure prophylaxis for women with childbearing potential. So this would be someone with a needle stick or something along that line. Um, should I feel comfortable offering dolutegravir as part of post-exposure prophylaxis to young women given more recent reassuring data? So um, in, this is purely my, my opinion. If that is the, the regimen 
that you would give to somebody who was not pregnant. I think there are no, no data at this point to say that it should not be given to a pregnant person or a person at um, risk <laughs> of becoming pregnant. Ellen, I, I also I want to recognize your expertise, and I think that you should join in here as well. So please <laughs> don't don't see yourself as just answer uh, asking questions. Please <laughs> feel free to answer some. Or would you agree with what what I just said? Yes, I I absolutely would agree. Yeah. I think um, you know the alternative in this uh, situation for post exposure prophylaxis would be raltegravir. And it's BID versus QD for dolutegravir. Um, it's better tolerated. Uh, and for that reason, I think you're going to get better adherence for as part of post-exposure prophylaxis. And the recent data really are so much more reassuring that I would agree that um, it should be it should be a regular part of post-exposure prophylaxis. And the Sapamo study is probably the best, the best study that's looked at this issue or around birth surveillance, but there have been many other studies that have looked at smaller cohorts and such that uh, also do not find a signal of note. Agree. So along the same line, uh, Dina D asked if we should still counsel people who are planning to become pregnant about neural tube defect risk when starting dolutegravir. So a woman, a woman who has childbearing potential is starting dolutegravir. Should, it, should we discuss the risk or the data about neural tube defect with those women is the question. I, th I think um, it would be very confusing because what you would be saying is there, we had a concern about it, but we no longer have a concern about it. So are you concerned or are you not concerned? So again, it would um, I would say it would be as you practice, how much information do you give your, your patients about all of the different agents, right? And if you tend to be on the side of lots and lots of information, it could be part of it. But if it, you're talking about specifically this issue, I think these data are reassuring enough to not include it routinely in your counseling. Yeah, I think, I think uh, if I could just add to that, Elaine, I think the tricky, the only tricky part of this is if this is a, a very informed a uh, person who might have done reading on their own and have heard about neural tube defects, in that case, then you have an opportunity to explain there's much better data, current data, yes. that, that goes against that. So I think you have to know who you're speaking to to, um, to best judge uh, whether that would be helpful or not. Right. And I, I think also in the U.S. we take a, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, a little bit more of a liability issue. And if sometimes you're concerned, well, what if on the rare chance something happens, will I be held responsible for not having having brought that up? But, but um, alternative agents have pluses and minuses as well. So you have to be prepared to talk about all, all, of, all of that. Absolutely, totally agree. Okay, our next question is from Ken Purdy, who is a PEDS ID doc, who has one patient with HIV who is now 11 years old. He's been well suppressed for seven years um, and undetectable with stable CD4 counts on Genvoya. The question is, are there significant advantages to switching to Bictarvi, in particular in terms of lipids and long-term risk of cardiac disease, or should I leave him on Genvoya? That's the first part of the question. So I'm going to ask you to address that because I don't think <laughs> I have enough direct experience 
to to speak to speak to that. Okay, I, I'm I'm happy to do that. From my perspective, Ken, um, I think it depends. First off, if the patient really uh, is very happy on Genvoya and um, is reluctant to switch, I would not switch them um, because you've got a winner going and you're doing well. The flip side is um, Elvitegravir, which is the integrase that's part of Genvoya, is, um, has a lower barrier to resistance than does Bictegravir. And so long-term, you might be doing a little bit better with Bictegravir based on the resistance pattern. The other, the other potential um, benefit of Bictarvi over Genvoya is that uh, Genvoya has uh, cobicistat, which is a, a booster agent, and has drug interactions with other drugs. So if this is a patient that might end up on other drugs or is on other drugs that could disrupt um, their metabolism, that's another consideration. But if you know, most of our kids are not on other drugs that, that interfere. So it's, um, it's not an absolute by any switch, uh, by any, by any um, means, but um, it could be considered. Victarvi is much smaller than Genvoya, and so a lot of uh, teens prefer that. Ellen, do you That's think there are advantages that, long, that we have enough long-term data to know if there are advantages around lipid profiles or, and the, the long-term investment for any of these? No, I, I, do, I don't. Um, I think that that's, um, that's much less studied. And of course, you know, uh, in, in particular in pediatrics, because we, we haven't had long enough time to, to follow these kids to see um, what those effects will be. Um, the second part of his question is uh, how to counsel, this is, this is a little trickier, how to counsel the mother, <laughs> when to have a discussion about the child's diagnosis. He is 11 years old. He probably already knows he has it from the internet and would like any tips. Um, so, you know, I think we preach that this is something that we want to start talking about as early as possible and to recognize that the child has a chronic disease and to over time name it and to help the family to get to the point of being able to speak openly with the child. Clearly that varies with each family. Um, I would say that it's probably critical that by 11, the conversation had be, be initiated. So the hard work is trying to understand the reluctance on the part of the, the parents and to begin to bring down those, those barriers. You're probably right, the kid knows something. Maybe they don't know that it's specifically HIV, but you're talking about um, you know, probably also um, mom talking about her, her status as well and how the child may have gotten it. So um, it's work with the mother or parents. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, our next question is from Teresa Corville. If a woman was diagnosed with HIV during early pregnancy, started on ART, and viral load has been undetectable for most of the pregnancy, is the baby still considered high risk? No, I think that baby would qualify as low, low risk. And if we're talking about undetectable, less than 50, 50 copies. Yeah. I, I think the only exception might be if it was acute HIV during pregnancy. Yes. That, that would be different. But in a woman who has um, uh, probably more longstanding HIV, I, that's, that's abs I totally agree. Yeah. I mean, if, if, we identify that it's acute infection, which is not, not so easy to do, then the baby is much more, has a higher risk of acquisition. So you really, you really want to be starting presumptive treatment. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, our next question is from Chizamizo Mudanyenga. Um, how should we handle possible situations where infants on EPNP, I think that's early it's postnatal enhanced. prophylaxis, enhanced enhanced. postnatal prophylaxis, test false negative due to the viral suppressive nature of enhanced postnatal prophylaxis, especially when using RNA-based diagnostic platforms. Do these false negative infants develop significant viral reservoirs? Um, I, I can't answer that whether they develop, um, so I, I can't speak to the viral reservoir. I can say that there have been some case, case reports. There isn't a large literature on, on those babies. Um, and, but we are seeing babies who test negative and not just because they're on enhanced or prolonged prophylaxis during breastfeeding, but also are possibly um, their moms are on tr suppressive treatment during breastfeeding. Um, and they may present with acute infection at the end of um, what looks like an acute infection at the end of breastfeeding or at the end of enhanced prophylaxis. So the one thing we can say is the importance of ongoing diagnosis and making sure that you determine um, infant diagnosis, infant infection status at the end of the extended prophylaxis or at the end of and at the end of breastfeeding. But I think we're at a point of inquiry to really understand what those kids look like and when they're acquiring infection. Ellen, you probably have a lot of insights into that too as somebody who studies. I agree. You know, I agree with treatment. everything you said. Um, yeah. yeah, I think I think following uh, testing testing the the baby throughout, and then importantly after they've stopped prophylaxis is is the most important thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, it looks like we have. Uh, let's see. There's a question about regarding breastfeeding for HIV positive moms who are well suppressed. Are you saying that joint decision making is occurring due to maternal request, or are there governing bodies that actually uh, recommend joint decision making? So I can be a, a, a little, um, um, let's see, obscure or foggy about this. What I can say is that the governing bodies may right now today in their guidelines say, you know, don't breastfeed, but there have been many conversations and that guidance is becoming more um, permissive, focusing on um, joint decision-making and endorsing the many health benefits for mothers and babies of breastfeeding. So I, I think, um, both CDC and, and um, US Public Health Service guidelines are going to be or are adopting more permissive approach. I think the most important thing is that we understand that women have felt that they could not talk about breastfeeding, that they, you know, if they had desires or social and cultural reasons for needing and wanting to breastfeed, that it was completely prohibited. And we wanna shift that conversation <laughs> so that we can support women in, in taking you know, the best decisions possible for themselves and their babies. Absolutely. Um, the next question is from Natalie Givens. Uh, I think it said that slide number 20 said 22% of infants with HIV were born to mothers who had acquired HIV during pregnancy. Do you think this reflects in utero transmission rates or were there delays in mom's ability to start antiviral therapy? Was referring to slide 20, Elaine. Yeah, so it's 22% during pregnancy and breastfeeding. 
So, so it's it's both, and uh, of during and it's really a question of identification, so that those women are generally from um, settings with a very high incidence, and that they may be tested early in pregnancy, but repeat testing later in pregnancy is not done, so infection is is missed. And the same right now in most um, high prevalence, low resource settings, there are no routine approaches to testing breastfeeding women. So often a woman who acquires HIV infection during breastfeeding will only be identified when her baby presents ill. So it's all about identification and all about keeping moms from not acquiring HIV infection. And th that's a, a perfect lead in to our next question from Regis, Regis Kreitzman, how to counsel discordant couples to prevent infection during lactation. Should condoms be recommended even if viral load is undetected or should you use PrEP or nothing? So I'm assuming discordant couple being the male having HIV, right? I um, would assume that yeah, too. Yeah, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, okay. Right. Mm -hmm. So probably the most important issue is for this individual to be virally suppressed less than 50 so that he doesn't you know, so there's no transmission, right? Um, and should, if, if he's if he's not, if, if there's any question about his suppression, I think that um, consideration would be given for, for the breastfeeding woman to be, to take PrEP, but that is really about protecting herself, right? And you would apply all of the same same factors in making that decision. And the same with condom use, probably. Yeah. Agree. Agree. Uh, and then from Dr. Rodriguez, would you recommend regular testing of the mother to check viral suppression during breastfeeding, as well as have the baby on prophylaxis and testing him or her? So uh, the mother is breastfeeding, and in addition to having the baby on prophylaxis and how to do testing. So, so I I'm gonna hunt on that because there aren't any. We we don't have great great data. We know that if moms are fully suppressed, the risk of uh, infection for the baby is extremely low. And in the PROMISE study and other studies, we've seen, seen, you know, one or two. So if you're, so there's really no evidence or no data to say those babies should be on postnatal prophylaxis, but if mom is suppressed, but, but as a clinician, you want to give them every opportunity to be protected. So Again, um, I think it would would depend on the particular case and how comfortable you are that mom is, you know, going to be able to maintain suppression. We have not yet figured out how often mom should be monitored or how frequently we should test the baby. I think all of that is for inquiry and um, are increasingly important questions. Agree. <laughs> totally agree. Uh, I think we're getting to the end. Um, there was a there was a last question that I think varies from site to site, which is: Are ER residents educated on what to do with a pregnant woman who shows up in the ER without a perinatal history, or I'm guessing antenatal history? What so, what to do around postnatal prophylaxis? 
I I would think that this had to do more with testing myself. If, Test. if a pregnant woman didn't know her status and, and it was nowhere in the chart, I'd probably test her first and then um, go down that road. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I agree. Uh, okay, I think we're supposed to be at the end of our question and answer period, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Jose, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So, so I, I do, I do want to thank everyone for their attention, for your great questions. Um, I certainly want to thank Dr. Abrams for enlightening us today with uh, all kinds of great information that will help us provide better care to our patients and our families. Um, and thanks so much for your attention. Thank you again. Uh, thanks for the great moderation and for joining in the question and answer period. That's, that's great. Fantastic. Thanks. <laughs> All right. So I'll take it from here as a reminder to our audience, evaluations and information on how to claim continuing education credits will be emailed by 5 p.m. Pacific time tomorrow. And this will enable us to review all of those that have attended today's live broadcast. Additionally, the on-demand materials for this webinar will be made available within the next 24 hours. As a reminder, the 2022 Ryan White HIV AIDS Program Clinical Conference will be held in San Diego, California from October 16th through the 18th. And we'd like to announce that the 2022 update of the drug resistance mutations is now available on our website. And then to coincide with that release, we have a upcoming two-part webinar series. Part one is now open for registration, and this will take place in um, October 27. And here is an upcoming course that we have, the 30th Annual Update on HIV Management in Chicago, Illinois, which will take place in December 8th. Again, we'd like to thank our audience for participation and to Dr. Abrams and Chadwick for an excellent discussion and presentation. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you, everyone. Jose, do you want me anymore or am I done? Oh, Dr. Abrams, you, you're free to log out now. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Yep. And I think I sent you my final. Yes, we received them. Thank you so okay. much. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks for all your help and sorry for all the delays. No worries. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Bye, Tammy.